Hello and welcome to the Providence College Podcast. I'm your host, Liz Kay, and I'm joined by producer Chris Judge of the Class of 2005. Here at the Providence College Podcast, we bring you interesting stories from the Friar family. Today, we're talking with Father Nicanor Ostriaco, a biologist who studies cell death and yeast, and a moral theologian who's a noted expert in bioethics. Father Nick, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you very much for having me on your show. As I was preparing for this podcast, your article about the recent controversy about the use of CRISPR in, on human babies popped up in the journal First Things. Could you explain this technology to our listeners who might not be familiar? So uh, CRISPR is a biological technology that was discovered a handful of years ago. And the really cool thing about CRISPR is that it allows us to edit DNA with incredible precision in a way that we were not able to do before. So um, when I teach this in class, I, I tell my students, imagine your genome as 46 volumes of this massive encyclopedia of 3 billion letters. And with CRISPR, we now have the technology to go in there on page 42, for example, of volume 3, column 4, the third sentence from the top, and we'll change a single letter. Uh, from a B to a G. And when you have that technology available to biologists, we now have the possibilities for good and for ill to alter genomes to see if we can um, fix things that have gone wrong. And conversely, we could also alter things to see what would happen if we change the genome in particular ways. And so there are so many possibilities and our society as a whole is grappling with the ethical questions that arise in light of this discovery. And the reason why you mentioned the First Things article is because a couple of weeks ago, a controversy erupted when a scientist in China announced that he had genetically engineered two babies for the first time. And so the, you know, the advent of CRISPR designer babies is now upon us. And no one is quite sure how to move forward because no one's quite sure what the moral principle should be to guide our behavior. And secondly, I think the particular challenge in a global society is that there is no institutional oversight committee, no way to enforce any rules or regulations that may be proposed by anybody. And so that's really where we are. And the danger, of course, is we now have rogue the possibility of rogue scientists basically engineering anything and everything in their garage. And without proper regulation, there's always safety issues that come up. And that's just one of the one of the many issues here, right? Because there's no, as you mentioned, there's no police force. There's no one who can say to anyone, um, who can effectively stop anyone. Well, doing. one of the things that's really exciting about CRISPR is that CRISPR is relatively cheap. In fact, you could go online and probably purchase the reagents, the supplies, the things that you would do, you would need in order to, to change an animal's genome. And if you had basic biological training, you could do it in your backyard. And so how are we going to control that? How are we going to go ahead and regulate that, especially when we have international boundaries that are very porous today? At the same time, the technology sounds very promising. It's incredibly exciting and promising, precisely because there are so many diseases out there that can be linked to particular genetic mutations. And the hope now is that we will be able to use CRISPR technology to correct those mutations for the first time and offer these families who have been carrying the scourge of a genetic disease for millennia, for generations, uh, a light at the end of the tunnel, a, a hope that they and their children will finally be freed of the genetic lottery that they are subject to. Well, Father Nick, you have a PhD in molecular biology from MIT. You have a doctorate in moral theology from the University of Freeburg. Now, and could you tell us about your current graduate studies here at the Providence College School of Business? So I'm a geek for God. That's what a Dominican is. And I've always wanted to understand. I've always wanted to know. And a few years ago, I attended a conference at the Vatican where I was expected to speak to CEOs and CFOs of different companies, stem cell companies about the ethics of stem cell biology. And during these conversations, I realized that they were speaking a different language, the language of business, and I had no, no insight into that language. So when I returned to Providence, um, you know, I took that to prayer 
And, you know, it really dawned on me in prayer. The Lord was saying, look, you're a Dominican. Uh, if you don't know a language, go learn the language. And I was like, well, what should I do? And, well, uh, in Providence, it became clear to me that I should just go ahead and start taking classes. And so with the permission of my prior provincial, I enrolled in PC's MBA program, and I've been doing that part-time for the last two and a half years, just taking a class here at a class there uh, in light of my other responsibilities here at the college. So you've decided to pursue an MBA because it would help you with your work as a research biologist and as a, an expert in bioethics. Mm-hmm. And it's also just really cool. I, I, you know, I've taken marketing classes now and accounting classes and finance classes, and they're just so different from the biology classes and the theology classes that I'm used to. And to be able to see the world as business people see the world has just been exhilarating for me because I didn't realize how different it is to see things through this particular lens. And I'm a novice at it. I'm still learning. I have my, you know, I have a couple of final projects to be d- this that is due this week. Um, but they, every single one of those classes has been an eye opener for me. And and for someone who's on this side of campus, who's in the arts and sciences, it's wonderful to begin to develop relationships and and to network with my colleagues and my classmates over at the School of Business. Excellent. And I'm, I'm laughing because you and I both have a final project because we're, right. we're both classmates. We're both classmates in our um, management class, which has been very cool. So uh, you've had some very interesting insights in that class of, in your role as the chief executive of your research lab. So I'm wondering what you could tell us about uh, what you've been able to apply from those classes. So um, I've been a PI. So PI stands for principal investigator. So I've been the head scientist of my research lab here at Providence College for 13 years now, and it's been a great blessing. And it's a primarily undergraduate laboratory, so I supervise uh, from between, you know, four. And this semester, I have a very large group, so I have 17 undergrads who are doing research in t- different degrees. And uh, one of the things that I've been able to see while pursuing my studies uh, over at the School of Business is that a laboratory, in many ways, is an organization that requires that the PI be able to manage Uh, his team. And so throughout the semester, I've been challenged to really begin to figure out ways to facilitate the communication between my research students and myself to try to handle um, disputes when they come up, to try to figure out how to motivate in a way that is productive and affirming of both the student I need to talk to, and, and, and everyone else in the lab is working with us. Could you tell us more about your lab? You so more? my laboratory is a, a laboratory that is focused on, um, well, first one project, now we have two. So our lab focuses primarily on how cells die, and that's really cool. Science is very cool. So it, um, it's really cool because a lot of diseases are linked to the inability of a cell to die when it should. So cancer cells, for example, tumor cells, uh, they, they don't die when they should die. And so one half of my laboratory is looking at a gene called Bax inhibitor, which we've been working on for the past seven years to try to understand how this gene, which has been linked to several human cancers, actually functions within the cell. And I have an incredibly talented group of undergrads and I've been blessed by the Lord with them. And over the past few years, we've been able to figure out that this gene, and I'm going to use a technical jargon, the gene encodes a pH-sensitive calcium leak that is localized to the endoplasmic reticulum. And, you know, my mother will tell me, what does that mean in English? And in English, what that means basically is that if you imagine a cell as a factory, what we've been able to do is we've been able to tie this particular gene to the assembly line of the factory. And what we've discovered is that this gene regulates the environment of the other workers on the assembly line by regulating the amount of calcium that is present in the atmosphere of the assembly line. And so uh, we're still trying to figure out, uh, trying to pin that all down. And our hope over the next couple of years too is that we would like to identify novel chemotherapeutic drugs that would prevent our gene product, our protein, from doing what it does. And the hope here is that these drugs by, uh, would be agents that could be used to treat patients 
whose tumors are driven by this master controller. So that's part one of my lab. And part two basically is we've just started a new project. I have some talented current students. We're looking at Parkinson's disease. So Parkinson's disease is actually the opposite. Here cells commit suicide that should not commit suicide. And they're committing suicide because of the presence of these clumps of protein uh, called alpha-synuclein. And my undergrads and I are trying to figure out how we can use yeast cells to understand how these protein clumps mess up cell function and trigger cell death. And again, the hope, of course, is to try to identify uh, drugs that could prevent these clumps of proteins from killing the cells. Now, the alumni of your lab, and which is known to some students probably as the uh, Dead Yeast Society, so it's got, a, it's got its unique branding there, um, have gone on to do some pretty amazing things. Can you tell us about uh, where So I've been blessed with about 70 undergrads over the last 13 years who've gone through my laboratory and who've... Um, the coolest thing, I think, is that I've been invited into their families and into their lives. I've married a couple to each other, and I've baptized some of their kids. I've been present when the one has, you know, proposed to another. It's just been really, re really, really exciting. Now, professionally, they've also gone on to do amazing things. I'm incredibly proud of them. Some of them have gone on to get their PhDs. I have about 10 of them who are either have had their, who've either earned their PhDs or are in the process of earning their PhDs. And um, a couple of them are actually professional scientists now. Uh, one is at Princeton. The other one is at the MIT Harvard Broad Institute. And so they're making me incredibly proud. I also have a lot of doctors, a lot of doctors and surgeons um, who are now doing residencies. I have dentists and vets. I have all sorts. And I even have, you know, in, many people will say, well, of all of those students, which one are you most grateful for? And I think because I'm a Dominican, I would have to say one of my alums is also a Dominican friar, and he's a student brother uh, in Washington. And I think I'm very particularly proud of him. Many of them, as I understand, have gone on to do, before they go on their professional journeys, have gone to explore kind of service um, in various parts of the world. So I think that's something that's incredibly uh, typical of a Providence College student. Many of our students have a very strong inclination towards service of others. And a handful of my own students prior to pursuing their professional career decided that they wanted to do something different. And so uh, several of them went on to serve either in the Philippines with Dominican Volunteers International. One of my students who's now in medical school uh, spent uh, nearly a year in Manila working in the slums. And then two of my students, uh, one, another one who's in medical school, one who is in the, in the process of applying to graduate school, uh, they both went to the Solomon Islands to serve there in different capacities. So again, it's not, I think it's not my lab. I think it's PC. I think there's something about the PC soul that really calls our students to dedicate themselves um, not only to their own personal needs and their personal desires, but seeking ways in which they can better themselves through the service of others. Well, we're recording this in the midst of finals week here at PC, which I, I know means a lot of late night study sessions for you and your students. Um, what's your approach to teaching? Can you tell us about that? My approach to teaching? Well, I teach both in biology and in theology. So in biology, my hope and my dreams involve exciting my students, right? So uh, science, biology doesn't really come alive when you're just reading a book. But as I tell my own research students, there's something about discovery. There's something about knowing that you are the first person in the history of the world out of 108 billion people who've ever lived. That's what the demographers said, that demographic uh, experts say. They say, look, 108 billion people have lived and to know, you know, usually at two o'clock in the morning, because that's the way science works, that you know something that no one else has known ever. And you know this one little thing about how a cell works. There's a thrill to, to that. And you, now, and of course, you hope and you pray in God's providence that your discovery will be a small piece of a puzzle that will, in the long run, uh, alleviate the sufferings of others. 
So my, my, my responsibility and my great privilege actually to be a biology professor is I think to introduce and to invite my students into that life, to discover that it's not about multiple choice questions, not even about exams. It's about changing the way that you see the world so that you can see God's creation um, in all its sophistication and all its complexity, but in a radically simple way, simply because it makes sense. And this is not, so, you know, my, 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 so my students have to be introduced to critical thinking. They have to, because that's in many ways the stance of a scientist. Um, we are called to look at the world with a skeptical eye, not because we don't think there's truth out there, but because we are so self-aware that it's easy to make mistakes. And the hope is that, you know, through a concerted effort of many in the scientific community, we will be able to discern the truth of the world and the truth of nature uh, in a way that will help our brothers and sisters. So we've talked about your approach to teaching in the biological sciences. What about... Um, in theology? Theology... Um, theology you know, I just finished, I will be grading today, a series of papers for my Growth in Christian Life class. And I had 24 amazing students from all over the college. And we talked, the whole semester was simply a conversation, an extended conversation on happiness. Because I think a lot of Christians don't realize that God wants us to be happy. And so the entire semester reading Aquinas, reading economics, reading about virtues and vices, to read about grace, to read about martyrs, to read about secular writers. All of this is to hopefully, again, invite them to see the world um, in a different way, to see the world as a world of great promise, but also a great struggle because of the presence of sin, um, and to see that God is a friend who wishes to accompany them to walk with them, to strengthen them, and to most of the time to carry them through the difficult times. I think that's my, that's my goal. You know, it's one thing I think when, it, when a theology, a student in a theology class memorizes certain things, but I think at the end of the day, I'm teaching so that when your kid is sick in the hospital and you are worried for his life, uh, what will you remember from Providence College? And I want them to remember that God loves them. God is deeply merciful. Um, God, through Christ, cries for them. He saves them. He calls them to joy. He embraces them in tears. Um, and that they will never be alone. One of your research students actually described this course as, as life-changing. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think it's probably because we deal with life. And you know, they're 20-year-olds, they're socially connected on media, they got thousands of friends uh, on Facebook, and yet they don't know themselves. They don't know about God, you know? And, and I understand because when I was an undergrad, I was so busy with my work um, that it took a while before the Lord smacked me on the head and said, look, look at me for a while. And I think that was part of my realization that, you know, the Nobel Prize, which is what I was aspiring for when I was in college, um, it pales in comparison to eternal life. And it, it's taken a while and continues to take a while to challenge me to, to put things into perspective. And my hope is that um, my students will begin to at least ask the questions, because I tell them this is not a class about answers, I, except for one. You know, there's, there is only one answer that I will propose, and that is Jesus Christ. But the... But, the, but hopefully in this class, they will be able to ask the questions that they will spend the rest of their lives answering. And I say, you know, there's only one exam on this for this class, and that's what's going to happen when you're on your deathbed. And when you sit back and you look at your life, however long or not so long it may be, you know, with science, you could live 130 years maybe. And, but at the end of the day, we all die. And you know, how is your life going to be such that when you're lying there and you're thinking, you're looking back uh, at the rear view mirror of life and 
you look back and you see what you have done and what you haven't done, will you be able to smile? Will you be able to laugh? Will you be able to thank the creator of the universe for this incredibly full life you have lived? And I said, well, if that's the goal, and I hope it is the goal for my students, um, then you've got to start now. You've got to start. And it's not necessarily that you can, you know, I don't know, you're going to go to church every day. But I tell them, look, one minute a day, say hello to Jesus. And some of them say, well, I don't even know Jesus. And I go, great. So you just go, Jesus, are you there? Jesus, do you, do, are you real? You know, some of our students are not sure. And I go, ask him. And I said, but be very careful because you might end up a priest, which is what had happened to me. So, um, but it's a matter of asking the questions and then asking the Lord to answer them in his own good time. I'd love to go back to that, those moments. Um, you mentioned being an undergrad and, and your, your ambitions and how they evolved. So could you tell us a little bit about your childhood? And, and So I grew up in the Philippines. Well, I'm a Filipino. I'm now a Filipino-American, uh, but I was a Philippine. I am a Filipino, and I grew up pretty much all over Asia because both my parents uh, are professors. And so I grew up in the Philippines. I grew up in Bangkok, Thailand, and I grew up in Penang, Malaysia. But most of my the cr- critical f- years of f- formation really were, were in Bangkok. And, and it was striking to grow up in a, in a Buddhist country. And I, I am so grateful to, to my Buddhist friends because in so many ways, I think they were able to help shape me as a person who would be able to, to see, to not take Christianity for granted simply because I grew up in a, in a culture where there were so few Christians. I um, always, always loved science, uh, wanted to cure cancer, win the Nobel Prize. So in gradu- in, uh, as an undergrad, uh, again, through the providence of God, I ended up attending the University of Pennsylvania, where I majored in bi- biomedical engineering. Uh, it was a culture shock to come to the United States, but it was incredibly exhilarating as well because there were so many opportunities in the United States that I didn't have back home in Thailand. And that's where I first, uh, I didn't know how someone became a cancer biologist, but in my sophomore year, I think it was my sophomore year, uh, I took a, an honors class on cancer biology. I was taught by a, a world-renowned cancer biologist, Peter Noel, who had discovered the Philadelphia chromosome, which is the first chromosomal abnormality associated with cancer. And we, there was a running argument that entire semester with me and him because he, he, one, of the, one of the constant themes of the class is that there is no such, there, cancer is not one disease. It's actually over 100 different diseases depending upon the particular cell that became cancerous. And since there's, there are about 120 or so cell types in your body, there are 120. And I remember arguing with him. I, I knew nothing. But one of the things is I had read this article in Scientific American by Leonard Hayflick about aging. And so I decided that I wanted to think through through aging. And there was nothing really known about aging at the time, certainly not the genetics. So um, when I went to grad school, I went to, the, to MIT. Um, I spent five years basically working with Lenny Garente. It was an exciting time. We spent five years working out some of the basic genetics of aging, which had not yet been done before. And, and there's something... There's something life-changing about MIT. One is the science, but also it's, it's at MIT where I encountered the Lord. I encountered the risen Lord, and it changed my life. I mean, I've been a Christian. I've been a Catholic all my life, but I think being at MIT, meeting undergrads and graduate students who are deeply passionate about their faith, uh, the Catholic fellowship, and then learning how to pray, and then you know, actually inviting the Lord to meet me where I was, and then to discover on um, the 7th of May, many years ago, at 5.30 in the afternoon, that he was alive, um, changed my life, changed everything. Because once you encounter the living God, um, the creator of the universe, uh, the scientist of all scientists, you know, once you discover him, uh, it's life-changing. And so within a couple of years, I'd resigned my position as a cancer biologist. Then at the University College London, the Ludwig Institute for Cancer Research in London, and I returned to the United States to enter the seminary. And what brought you to the Dominican Order? Oh, people ask me that all the time. And 
you know, when they ask me that, I say, you know, why did you marry your wife or why did you marry your husband? And they'll say, well, it was, I don't know, it just fit. And it's the same thing I can give you. The Order of Preachers fits. Um, when I met the Dominicans, they made me see that I've always been a Dominican. Um, I've loved books. I love the smell of books. I love the way books are. I love to think. I love, I love asking questions and then, you know, struggling to answer them. And in the Order of Preachers, I met other men who had the same passion, um, particularly the passion for Christ. And because he is the truth, he is the life. And so when I met them, they offered me, they, they, through them, the Savior of the world invited me to live a life uh, where I could be myself truly. Can you tell us about your path to Providence College? Well, um, I... PC is uh, one of the apostolates of the Dominican friars of the Eastern Province of the United States. And I am a friar of the Eastern Province of the United States. And so uh, halfway through my seminary formation, um, my religious superiors were like, look, you have a PhD from MIT, so we're going to send you to PC in order to do science and, I was, and evangelize. And I was like, okay. <laughs> And so when I was ordained to the Holy Priesthood, I needed one more year to finish my license in theology, and then I was sent here. And this is my first, and I think, and God willing, it will be my only assignment. You know, I came here 13 years ago, and uh, it's strange because when I pray my rosary every night, I walk by our cemetery in the middle of campus, and I go, one day I'll be in there. You know, that, that, and my students freak out sometimes because they say, what is it like to know where you'll be buried? And I go, well, I... I know where I'm going to be waiting, right? So I, I know, and it's not scary to me. I was when I was a kid, but I love planes, so I do a lot of traveling. And um, it's like being in a waiting room in the, you know, in the, at the gate, and you're waiting for the announcement of your flight, and there's a delay, and you're just waiting, and you're having wonderful conversations with people, but that's not the purpose of it. And... Um, you know, one of the things that I've come to see as a Christian, as a Dominican, is that uh, I'm called to live eternity. And um, this is, this is kind of like, you know, I'm going to work my darnest to, to preach the gospel and to, to speak about my Savior, but I can't wait to meet him. So, as you describe yourself, I, you know, you're an academic, you're a theologian, um, you're a student, um, but you usually describe yourself as a priest first. And can you tell me how that fits into your life? Our culture is immersed in a debate over identity. And, you know, I'm, this Christmas I'll be writing a, a scholarly paper on the metaphysics of identity. And so I've been thinking about identity. And one of the things that's striking is that an identity is a, an answer to a question. You know, it's what are you, who are you? And, one of the things I'm thinking about is, well, I realize we have a lot of identities. And one of the things that we have to do is we've got to put those identities in order. You know, there has to be, in many ways, an identity that we embrace that clarifies the relationships amongst all these other identities. And, bec and for me, that identity, the identity that... Um, helps me to figure out what I have to do from moment to moment in life is I am a Dominican priest. Um, I've been given a mission. Uh, my Savior will ask me about that mission when I see him face to face. And so every moment of my life, I have to ask myself, you know, as a Dominican priest, what am I going to do for my final project for that MBA class? Or as a Dominican priest, should I take that invitation to go to that conference? As a Dominican priest, how am I going to talk to that student in Bio 103, which is the introductory freshman biology class? How am I going to talk to her because she's struggling, because she wants to be a surgeon so badly, but because of her preparation or lack thereof, it's a steep climb. So I'm going to go in there and talk to her as a Dominican priest. And um, a Dominican, because our passion is for souls, and our passion is for the salvation of souls. And a priest, because first and foremost, I have to be an instrument of mercy. 
an instrument of grace. You know, in our MBA class or management class, one of the things that was so striking is that during our discussions of how bosses deal with their subordinates, there is no clear understanding of who the boss is. And, you know, is he simply a manager who's there to make sure that profits are maximized? Um, yeah, he could. But as a priest, you see, if I was ever a manager, I would go and say, it, was not, it, was, it would not just be about the company. It would have to be about this person made in the image and likeness of God, priceless, beyond all price. I have to look at this person. I have to say, what brings joy to this person? And how am I, yeah, it's going to be a difficult conversation, but he's, got, he's struggling. He's got wounds. So have I. And how are we going to get through this conversation in a way that he is better able to understand the call that he is receiving, whether he acknowledges it or not, to excellence? And not just excellence in terms of the bottom line, but as a human being. He's called to become a man of virtue, a man of holiness. And as a priest, I have the privilege of hopefully hinting at that during our conversation. Well, Father Nick, I think anyone looking at your schedule between the classes you're teaching, the classes you're taking, the research you're doing, the travel you're doing, people would be surprised you'd be able to find time for your prison ministry. Can you tell us how that <laughs> fixed your life? So I don't, I don't talk much about my prison ministry, but in so many ways, it's what keeps me grounded. Um, so about seven years ago, I was asked again, in a way that it was unexpected to serve as a chaplain for a community of prisoners who were lay Dominicans up in Massachusetts. So people don't realize that the Dominican order is made up of priests, brothers, sisters, and then there are lay men and women. And so there's a group of men at, uh, at MCI Norfolk prison up in Norfolk, Mass, about 45 minutes north of Providence. And um, for the last seven or so years, I go up there hopefully every month and in order to say the Holy Mass for them, in order to speak to them about God's mercy. But it is they who have taught me much. Because, you know, here at PC, I, I work and live amongst immortals. They're always 18. For the last 13 years, I've been working with 18 to 22 year olds. They never seem to grow old. And yet when I go to the prison, they remind me, my brothers in the prison remind me that death, death is real. That especially since many of them are um, incarcerated with no chance of parole, they're lifers or first degree lifers, they're the ones who have taught me about the importance of life, you know, the moments in life. Um, how are you going to spend the next 35 years in a prison that is a third the size of PC's campus, right? 35 years. And it's not like you can go to class. It's not like you even have Ray. Um, and yet in the midst of that, they, they have joy. They have hope. They have taught me about grace. They have taught me about mercy. And I am so grateful to my brothers in the prison as well as to the Lord who has called me to serve them as uh, a priest, as, as, as a Dominican priest. Father, I think we could keep talking to you forever, but we're going to have to end this conversation somewhere. Um, thank you very much for joining us on the podcast. It's thank you very much for having me. God bless you and Merry Christmas. Subscribe to the Providence College podcast in all the usual places, including iTunes, SoundCloud, Stitcher, Google Play, and our newest platform, Spotify. If you like what you hear, please review and share with others. Thanks for listening and go Friars.